have too. And it's quite easy to, I think in, in a lot of cases to mistake or to misunderstand the cause of certain uh, gender inequities as they relate to work unless we take an aerial view. And so one of the things that I'm going to encourage us to do today um, is to think aerially. And, and what I mean by that is that instead of thinking what we would call more anecdotally, meaning instead of thinking about um, how people's lives and how women's lives in particular, how they sort out as the result of a series of individual choices, what uh, we do sociologically is we try to think about the forces that cause you to make the decisions that you do. So it's a very sort of Americanized, individualized perspective to think that everyone is is in you know, ultimate control of their destiny. Um, when from a sociological perspective, we know that while you can make individual choices, the circumstances that cause you to have a certain series of choices over others um, are often very uh, strong shapers in the way that our lives uh, progress. So what I would like to do is to share with you um, this presentation. Let's, let's go ahead and first see, are you all able to see the slides now? Okay, great. I'm actually gonna leave it in this particular view instead of blowing up the slides the full way. And the reason I'm doing that is that I find that sometimes I, at least in, when I teach, I have trouble getting back to, to real life faces. <laughs> so we're gonna leave it right here. Let me make this recommendation in terms of questions. Uh, first of all, make sure that, you're, you're, that you are muted. I think I muted everyone when you came in if you weren't already in that mode. So make sure that you're muted. And then secondly, um, I'll pause occasionally and ask you know, if, if anyone's got questions, and then I'll leave some time at the end for questions too, so that we can be sure uh, to have some time to discuss these things. Um, so this is, this is kind of where I wanna start though. I, I want us to think about um, what is gendered labor about? When we're talking about the fact that men and women um, work, and we're talking about topics like the wage gap, and if you're not familiar with that term, the wage gap um, is the term that we use to describe the fact that men tend to make more money doing the same job as women do. So for instance, um, and, and I'm looking right here in this first bulleted point, um, before COVID hit, um, women were paid about 82 cents for every dollar that a man made for doing a similar type of job or identical work. Um, and, and so that's what we talk about whenever we say the wage gap. Now, when we try to look for reasons why the wage gap happens, economists will often uh, give us this ratio right here, if you can hopefully see me highlighting that. Um, economists will often say, well, the wage gap is attributable to this. It's 60% choice and it's 40% bias. From my vantage point, uh, that is a terrible, terrible um, set of numbers. Uh, it, when we have virtually 50% of an economic phenomenon that creates gender inequity, you know, attributable directly to bias, so we're already in trouble from a social and ethical perspective. However, um, it gets worse. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, we know that the reason why women tend to make less money than men for identical work, again, 40% of the time, we can attribute that to just flat out bias. Um, women are perceived perhaps in an interview as too weak um, when, when they, you know, displayed no signs actually, you know, that, that, that they would be a problematic fit for a role, right? Or um, it, in some cases we, we might have, again, an interview setting where there's already been sort of a preordained idea that only a man would be a suitable fit, you know, from a cultural perspective. So 40% of the time we can pretty conclusively prove bias, which again is awful, but again, it gets worse. 60% of the time, economists will describe the reason for the wage gap as a phenomenon that they simply call choice. Now, I've got choice in quotation marks because, as I was mentioning earlier, it's very problematic to talk about our choices as if we have all the choices in the world and as if we can freely make any choice that we wish, right? We know, for instance, that the choices that we make are largely ones that are um, determined by the environments in which we live, by the geography, by the place that we live in. Um, they are largely determined by, um, you know, by our family, by you know, those people who most influence us, and by simply what we know about the world already. So everyone does not have an equal set of choices. And sociologically speaking, this is one of the very first things that we study 
is the fact that although we all kind of feel like free individual people, at the same time, we tend to adopt or tend to think like our social group, right? So when economists talk about choice in the wage gap, what they're really meaning is that women tend to make decisions that lead to their own economic disadvantage. Okay, so let me say that really clearly. Women tend to make decisions that lead to their own economic disadvantage. What does that mean? Well, I am a great case study of that very thing. Um, when I uh, was in grad school, I, uh, my husband is someone who works in the corporate world, and I decided to continue grad school because we could live on his salary. So that was one choice that I made to delay my, um, my emergence into the professional paid world, but I made that choice in large part because of encouragement that I had. I didn't have much encouragement growing up to run after big bucks. I had encouragement to study to follow my dreams, right? Now I'm super happy with how it uh, how it all panned out, but we also know that women are tend to be encouraged um, to go into fields still even today, where uh, that have more to do with their passions, while men tend to be encouraged to go into fields that have more to do with money earning. So. I, you know, I, I like to use my own uh, case as a great example here. Um, when I got pregnant and had kids, I was in grad school. And so I put a pause on my education. That was me pressing the pause button, I guess. <laughs> I put a pause on my education so that I could, uh, you know, deal with newborns. And so it took me longer to get my PhD than it did my peers because I, you know, I had actually, by the time it was all, was all said and done, I had my three kids while I was in grad school. And what that means is that I didn't begin to become a wage earner. Was it through my own choices? Sure. But were there also some various other situations that probably caused me um, or that highly influenced the way that I made decisions? You bet. My husband being in the corporate world, for instance, will always make more money than I do in education. And so we have a really typical family arrangement in terms of the economics that often characterize gendered relationships in the sense that if someone's got to put their career on pause, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's usually in a, hetero, in a heterosexual relationship, it's usually the woman because she is often paid less um, whatever field she's in, it is often the case that that couples will decide to sacrifice or to pause her career shortly in order, you know, just to just to simply, you know, pay the bills. So that's why I, I want us to, to be very wary of this idea that 60% choice is really cho things we, we actively control. Because a lot of the time, uh, the things in our lives that, that characterize our money earning over time are a series of choices that we make, not because we had all the choices in front of us per se, but they have a lot to do with our socialization across time. So before COVID, as I mentioned, the wage gap was about roughly, women made about 82 cents for every dollar that men uh, make. After COVID, that number has gone up ever so slightly, and it would appear to be an improvement, 82.3 cents, right, per every dollar. This is not an improvement, though, because what some economists are telling us who study gender is that the reason why that gap has, has, has narrowed is actually because more women are dropping out of the workforce entirely. So this gap looks like an improvement, but when we're talking about the, about the reality of why it shrank in the way that it did, it has more to do with the fact that women, that more women have simply removed themselves from the workforce due to the pandemic. So it will surprise no one here probably to hear that um, women did drop out of the workforce more quickly than men for many of the reasons that I was just mentioning, right? There is more of an expectation that women do child caretaking. And so if you've got to choose between one family member and another, not only are there gendered, pressure, uh, gendered pressures for women to take care of, of, of children, but on top of that, many women make less money than their uh, male partners. And so as a result, it makes financial sense for them to do this too. We know that mothers with young kids dropped out of the workforce four to five times more often than did fathers. So again, a lot of this comes back to, to gendered family expectations. If women are seen as the ones who are primarily in charge of childcare and caretaking, um, then when it has to happen intensively, like with the, you know, the online school environment, then this is one of the things that we see. Now, here's the impact of this. And I'm looking now here at this third bullet down. Women in their 20s, and so you know, there's, there's lots of evidence of basically about how much lifetime earning you lose 
depending on how much time you stay out of the workforce. And I'm really interested in this because this describes me to a T. I took off, actually, I guess I was technically in my 30s. Um, I took off, I was a stay at home mom for six years and I was working on my PhD at that time, but I was not wage earning, okay? Women in their 20s who take off five years, only five years, okay, tend to lose a 20% in total lifetime wages. So that's a huge number. And the reason why, again, I, I, wanna, I want us to, to kind of question this idea of, of choices, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in just a minute, but this is an important conversation to have because many times uh, the reason why couples make these choices is because it's just what they saw their own parents do, right? Or it's for a series of reasons that nobody can actually verbalize, <laughs> but it has quite a lot to do with just gender norms and gender expectations. Those are changing very quickly in our culture. Um, we have far more uh, dads doing child caretaking and uh, far more stay-at-home dads than we ever have. But it's an important thing to still understand that we are to a very large degree um, playing out the patterns, let's say, that previous generations um, have had. Now, this is an important statistic around here to think about, or down here, sorry. Single mother households make up about a quarter of the households in the U.S., Okay, that is a huge number. Kansas and Missouri, about the same. So, so what we experience in our, in, in our locale in terms of single mother households is about in line with the national average. And the reason why that is so important is because to a large degree, and you might have heard the term used to describe the pandemic's economic influence, that it's been a, a she session rather than a recession. <laughs> um, you know, 2008 was called a re, you know, the great recession. But the reason why this particular economic um, uh, barrier is being called a she session is because many of the hardest hit people have been women who work primarily in the service sector, which has been, again, one of the, the, the major sectors that has been economically damaged due to the pandemic. So let me uh, tell you a little bit then about some of the, the labor forces that often impact women. And then after we, we talk about that, then I'll stop briefly to ask for any questions. Now, when we talk about gender and labor, we have these funny little terms. That they're, they're kind of standard now in the, in the study of gender and labor. Um, but they, they remind me, particularly the one called sticky floors, it reminds me of like what happens when someone spilled their apple juice. So, <laughs> but that's not what it means in this context. So um, you are probably familiar with the term glass ceiling, right? A glass ceiling, as the name suggests, is some sort of barrier that keeps women, but by the way, other people from other populations too, from advancing economically. And the primary reason for this uh, tends to be gender discrimination. Um, this is something that we also find that gay men struggle with. We also find that black men have glass ceilings. So uh, the people most often hurt the worst from glass ceilings will be people who have multiple forms of marginalization. So we're talking about, um, you know, uh, like for instance, you know, women of color would have two forms of, mar of social marginalization or lesbian women of color would have three. So uh, studies that look at the ways that different uh, jobs treat women in general will note that, um, that if you do not represent sort of the, the white um, kind of straight masculine ideal, then there is probably in the workplace some sort of glass ceiling that is built in. Now that's not true for all professions, okay? So this is a generalization, but, but this is still a phenomenon that we see across the US today. We also have another phenomenon called the glass escalator. The glass escalator is the phenomenon wherein men, um, men who are in female predominant fields like men who are in nursing or men who are in elementary education, something like this. In those circumstances, men tend to advance far more quickly than women in those fields. So again, it's, it, you know, if, if one is a ceiling and it's a barrier, the other is the escalator, it's the fast track. So we'll even often find ironically in some cases that men who want to be elementary education teachers, for instance, um, will receive a lot of cultural pressure to become principals, even when they want to remain in the classroom. So this goes back again to those gendered and those social norms, right? If the expectation is that men are leaders and women are nurturers, then in environments where there is caretaking or nurturing, which tend to be female predominant environments, then you will often have a scenario where men advance very quickly to the top ranks and they become leaders, 
whereas women remain um, doing the, the, the lower paid work. So um, the reason that I, I wanna bring this up is because it's really important to recognize that all of this is part of the choice that I was just talking about, even though we can statistically prove that yes, this particular male third grade teacher, you know, decided to, you know, to, to pursue a, a principal's role. Um, we know through certain phenomena that he is simply more likely to be successful when he does these things, right? So we've got all of these various things going on. Now let's talk about the sticky floor. Again, not about apple juice, even though again, it sounds very much like apple juice. The sticky floor is a labor phenomenon. And what happens is that um, this is where certain workers are stuck at a particular level and they can't break free. So low wage workers are predominantly what we call sticky floor workers. These, uh, these type of wage earners, at least in our economy right now, tend to be women. So we're talking about people who do home health jobs. We're talking about people who might do fast food jobs. We're talking about people uh, who, who work at preschools, daycare centers, right? And so the problem with sticky floors, um, again, apart from the obvious, you know, the obvious literal meaning, the problem of, with sticky floors is that uh, people who uh, are, enter the, the labor market in low wage labor often have a very difficult time climbing some sort of ladder because again, of certain gendered ideals about professionalism, about the cost of education, a number of different things that tend to keep them there. So when we think about these three phenomena, the glass ceiling, the glass escalator and the sticky floor, right? We've got all of these dynamics going on at place. And unfortunately, women tend not to have a glass escalator effect. Um, there are a few individual, more anecdotal circumstances that we could point to where a woman is on a glass escalator, particularly if she's in a career or in, in a company where there's high demand for, um, or, or greater demand for diversity. But generally speaking, women um, do not have glass escalators. They usually are under glass ceilings or are stuck to sticky floors. I know that those are <laughs> that not very inspiring metaphors, but those tend to be the labor dynamics that, that we see. So what causes this? Now we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in depth, but I, I wanted to just to, to give you a little reminder that I'm gonna be talking aerially, like from above, right? So that's why I gave you this picture of what it looks like from an airplane, because it's really hard sometimes to pick apart people's individual choices from the social factors that cause them to lean one way or the other. Um, and people are often not themselves aware of all of their motivations in making choices. And this is why, again, the field of sociology can be so helpful is because it really does assist us in using statistics to examine um, why people make decisions in the way that they do and how the patterns all work themselves out. So I'm gonna be talking very aerially for the next few minutes, but, but here's a couple of things. And, and, and these, this, these last two bullets a couple of things that I want us to remember as we're talking about things like if we're going to talk about the family and we're going to talk about, you know, that show Leave it to Beaver, that to be honest, students have no clue what that is anymore. So you want to talk about an aging moment, like they don't even know what that thing is. So we're going to, we'll talk about that. Um, but here's are two, here are two important things to keep in mind. First of all, sorry, I'm not used to this camera. First of all, okay. <laughs> All social systems, all societies are trying to replicate themselves. Now, what that means is that a society is when, when more people are born, instead of changing the society to something new, what do you do with kids? You try to make them match the adults, right? You teach them adult habits. You teach them about adult jobs. You teach them manners, right? So um, replicating a society is the business of society. And that's important to remember because I think it's, it's, it's easy sometimes to think that, you know, again, we got a lot of freedom, we can do whatever we want, but generally speaking, that is not how societies tend to unfold. They tend to replicate to a large degree what happened in the past. Now, of course, they don't replicate it perfectly and societies clearly change over time, right? But generally speaking, um, if, you know, if you think of one society or one generation like a cookie cutter, the next generation, will be that cookie cutter, but came around and kind of pinched the corners. And then the next one, maybe, you know, that, but you know, someone else pinched the corners a little bit more. So society tends to change pretty slowly. When we're talking about a quick social change in norms, quick social change is like a decade. 
super fast social changes a decade. More frequently, we're talking about um, 50, 100 years before something substantially changes in terms of social norms. And then secondly, ooh, <laughs> two. <laughs> secondly, um, you and I are totally rewarded socially for going along with what everyone else says to do, right? Like we are totally rewarded for our conformity. And in gender, sometimes we call we call this paths of least resistance, which is a term that, you know, a metaphor you're probably familiar with too. So the reason I want to I want to kind of throw all these things out at you is because if we know now, you know, what we just talked about, that the labor market is skewed in many ways against women, particularly at the moment in light of the pandemic. And if we know that in labor in general, that there are certain dynamics that keep women from rising to the top, or there are certain barriers in their way that simply make it more difficult for them um, to, to progress the same way that many, um, again, white straight men are at the top of doing. Um, we're not going to really understand why these things happen unless we can take a more aerial view and look at all of the different puzzle pieces that fit together. Okay, I'm going to stop for a second. Is there anyone who has questions? And if not, that's totally fine too. Okay, I'll keep on going. Again, if you've got questions, hold them and I'll stop in just a minute and, uh, and I'll, um, I'll ask again. Okay, so we can't understand a lot about what goes on here unless we first understand how family. Um, I always talk about families. I introduce the topic of family in my gender classes by talking about families as gendered machines. And like students' eyes bug out whenever I say this. They're always like, well, my family is, my mom's not a machine. I'm like, I'm not saying your mom's a robot or anything. <laughs> okay. What this means instead is that one of the jobs of families from a sociological perspective, right? From that kind of big aerial perspective, one of the jobs of families is to create people who fit into society. Okay, now, again, I know that that sounds like a, it sounds even sort of cold and detached right it, it sounds kind of sad, I guess, if you, if you, you know, if you're one of the mental types, which I sort of am. <laughs> but the reason why we have to think about it in this particular way is that if you think about how in our society we think about bad families um, or good families right good families tend to produce children who succeed, in other words, they conform very well right? They meet certain ideals. Um, they tend to do a, a, a number of things or earn a certain uh, type of living. Bad families, on the other hand, we often say are those who don't uh, live up to certain, you know, ideal stereotypes, who don't meet certain ideals, who don't conform, you know, to, to certain social values. So when we look sociologically at a lot of the talk that exists in our culture about families and what they are, it's really interesting because, um, and I'm, I'm skipping down a little bit. Um, in our culture, we almost always describe families in moral terms. Remember how I just said good families, bad families, right? There is a lot of panic that exists in various realms of society over whether families are doing it right. Um, there's a lot of blame that is assigned to various family members if someone breaks the law or if, you know, someone behaves in a non-traditional way. A lot of the blame, again, is placed on the family. And one of the reasons why this is, and, and I don't, it, it is true that our families are highly influential. That's, there's absolutely no doubt about that, right? But um, what is really interesting is if you study the structure of families, what you'll find is that the shape families take is very often a matter of economics. It's not necessarily a matter of choice. So for instance, in the early, early 20th century in the US, it was much more common, particularly among immigrant families, to have extended generations living together, right? And in, uh, around the world, it's just far more common to have extended generations living together. This nuclear family idea that we tend to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, two parents and kids and the picket fence and the dog, uh, the nuclear family idea, though, did not really become widespread in the U.S. until closer to the mid 20th century, and particularly after the economic boom of World War II. So this idea that that's always how the family has been, no, um, families have actually taken on a number of structures across time and place. Nevertheless, one of the things that you will find is that there is a lot of paranoia about whether, again, families are right or families are doing it right or, you know, any number of things like this. 
In fact, what we can find in a lot of the rhetoric that a lot of political and social groups will often uh, share is that if there is a new type of family or if there is a new power arrangement in a family, um, political groups will often get really antsy about that change. So for instance, um, there was a, a really now quasi infamous um, episode of, of Fox News. Uh, I think it was from 2014. This is when Megyn Kelly was still at Fox, right? And Megyn Kelly, uh, you know, had a career briefly been on the Today Show, but is, is a well-known female journalist. Again, worked for Fox for, for quite a while, um, identifies herself as conservative. And um, one of the interesting things about this particular episode that really made waves across, across the entire news sphere is that there was a new study that had come out that was demonstrating that, that women were now to a degree that they never have before in the US, in some cases making more money than their male counterparts. In other words, what this simply means is that many women are now the breadwinners in their family. Um, now, it's, it's, not, it's not quite at half yet. <laughs> But, but it's, it's creeping up there, it's getting close. And to a large degree, we should be super happy about this, right? I mean, this is, this is an indication that we're, we're getting better parity. We're, we're working towards more wage equity. It is still the case that we've got that wage gap out there that tends to be exacerbated by lower wage workers, but we've still got some other great stuff going on. There was an entire Fox News episode about whether the fact that women were now making more money would cause the family to collapse. Would children stop going to college now that women um, were not, uh, you know, uh, were not stay-at-home mothers? Um, would would there be more crime as a result of women not, you know, doing kind of the June Cleaver thing, right? And so it, it was a fascinating episode to watch. I sometimes show it in one of my classes, in fact, because Megyn Kelly loses it on those guys. <laughs> she's there with a couple of male commentators, and they're, you know, they're doing the hand wringing, and she's like, "Y'all, listen, I am a mother." This is what the science says. You can't tell me that you know that you know my my children are now going to become criminals because I have a job. But this is exactly what we hear, and we've heard it for several hundred years, generation after generation after generation after generation. When there is a change in the family structure, or when there is a change in the power structure in the family, then there's a lot of hand wringing. Now, the reason for this, and I can put on like my ethicist hat for a minute and say, yeah, that's what people do whenever societies change people in power, in this case, largely men, they freak out. That's, that's kind of normal, <laughs> right? So there's that. But from the, the more sociological perspective, um, again, societies try to, they, they go for conformity. They try to, to address equilibrium, right? They try to kind of balance things out so that change doesn't happen too fast. So even though um, for many of us, uh, you know, being uh, working mothers is a, is a normal thing, that change has been going on for generations and it still inspires the same degree of panic, ironically, as it did even 50 or 60 years ago. So it's always kind of interesting to see that, that this rhetoric that we sometimes hear, it's not new. It's been around for a long, long time. Now, let's talk about, this is uh, one of my favorite concepts, this concept, misplaced nostalgia. And here's a book recommendation. Um, this is a really wonderful, accessible book. Um, the author is Stephanie Kuntz. She's an historian of family life, um, does some great sociological work. This is one of her books called The Way We Never Were. American Families and the Nostalgia Trap. It's, it's a great, again, very readable, very accessible book. What Kuntz does in this book is that she, she's trying to trace why Americans spend so much time thinking that the ideal is Warden June Cleaver here, right? Why do Americans do that? And what she does is she says, well, those uh, Warden June Cleaver weren't actually the norm. Um, she tries to help us understand that our so-called memory of the past isn't really all that accurate at all. And this is why she calls it misplaced nostalgia. We have this yearning for the past, but it's misplaced because like very few people actually led the sort of lives that the, that the cleavers, you know, led. So in the 1950s, she says, if you look at the average American family, they were not the cleavers. The average American family um, could not afford to live the sort of life that the Cleavers were living. Um, the average American family at that point was white, 
but from um, you know from kind of a bare bones you know economic perspective, um, the mom at home and dad goes out to work thing that was not feasible. Mom and dad both had to work in the fifties. Um, in you know for the majority of American families where again there was not enough economic stability that that you know one person had the luxury of staying home. Most people of color were also in that situation. And one of the things that we know, and you, you might be aware, you've seen the Rosie the Riveter posters, right? That in World War II, and actually took up paid labor as the male workforce subsided due to the war. And there were some fascinating statistics when, when the men came back home, upwards of 75% of women who were employed in paid labor did not want to leave their jobs. But, and this is a, an example of a super fast social change, there was tremendous pressure to return paid labor to men because again, you know, in the war recovery, this was just seen as kind of how it had to happen. And so we see a lot of family guidebooks and other sorts of like newspaper articles and advice columns and women's magazines pop up that encourage women to become housewives and mothers and to leave the paid workforce to make room for the men, so to speak. So the statistics from the time indicate that a very large number of women at the time didn't want to do that, but there was a lot of social pressure as part of the war recovery effort to follow that particular pattern. Now, one of the things that Kuhn's talks about in this is that we also often tend to remember the 1950s, you know, kind of leave it to beaver scene as, um, <clears throat> as a time where, you know, everyone followed the moral rules and like the worst problem anyone had was rock and roll. <laughs> You know, and, the, and the, that family life was really pristine. And actually, she says it wasn't that either. And that's one of the reasons why she talks about kind of this misplaced nostalgia. Um, one of the things that, that she points out is that teen pregnancy rates were actually incredibly high in the middle 20th century. Ironically, they've really only been dropping um, overall since that point in time. And really, teen pregnancy rates have, have begun to drastically drop. Um, in about the, the last 20 to 25 years. Um, it, it's really due to the fact that, that you know, contraception is now no longer a taboo topic. But in the middle, um, in the middle of the 20th century, um, the way that you handled an unexpected pregnancy was you got married, right? And so while we tend to think about you know, these idealized marriages and everyone following the moral rules, she says, no, actually, teen pregnancy rates were very, very high, but they were covered up by the fact that the solution was marriage. Um, and the middle 1950s is also known for having incredibly high domestic violence rates and incredibly high rates of, of people reporting that they were in, in unhappy marriages. So the reason why I, I wanna bring all of, I'm, like, I'm not trying to be a downer, right? <laughs> why I want to bring all of this up is because it's really important to know that our ideals aren't based in reality um, and that this ideal was actually only what the white kind of upper class very affluent uh, type of American family could do um, in the middle of the 20th century and, and that just wasn't everyone. Now I, I don't mean that, that the people who engaged in this family structure were wealthy per se what I'm simply trying to say is that the post-war economic advances were not equally spread across the American population. And so there was much more diversity to American family life. It was much more informed by economics, right, than by anything else. So when we see people hand wringing today about the role of women in the workplace and how they idealize June Cleaver and all of these things, we really, from an historical perspective, we gotta put the brakes on. Um, because again, that is not an accurate depiction uh, to a large degree of how American life was for a majority of women, even in the middle 20th century. Okay, so let's think for a moment about this, about what happens when children come along and then I'll stop after this and we can take another moment for questions. I assume you're, that most of you are familiar with the second shift, but and so if you are, my apologies, I'm gonna define it real quickly. Um, this is a term that was actually coined by a sociologist, Arlie Hochschild, um, and she wanted to talk about the way, it's a situation that many women know, you go to work during the day and then you come home and you got to do all the work at home too, right? So she wanted to describe the fact that um, women were working another shift to a degree that their male counterparts, their husbands, their boyfriends, right, tended not to do. So. The stereotypical example of the second shift is that mom goes to work during the day. I mean, let's say she's got an eight to five job and uh, 
she gets home and then she has to also cook dinner and then she also has to do the laundry and then she also has to do all the child maintenance, you know, all the stuff you got to do with kids until you can get them into bed. And then she's also in charge of the social calendar and she's also in charge, you know, like there's a, you know, a, a cake walk on Friday and she said that she would donate a cake for the school carnival. And then, you know, there's a play date next week and we got to get so-and-so's kid together with so-and-so's other kid. And then there's a birthday party three weeks after that. So she's in charge of all of those things domestically in addition to her regular job. Okay. So, and here's where in my mind for a lot of women today, the rubber meets the road <laughs> because this continues to be an incredibly difficult topic. And what we know is that even though the tide is shifting, this is one of those slow changes women still do the vast majority of domestic labor in the house, um, even when both partners work. So again, it's, it, it's changed. It's one of those slower changes. It's not on the fast track, right? Um, but, but here are some interesting things that we know about the second shift. When workers make accommodations for flexible work, okay? And what I mean by that is, you know, kind of what we're doing right now. When, um, when a workplace, you know, perhaps before COVID said, hey, um, uh, worker who is a mom, uh, you can work from home a couple of days a week um, using Zoom and your life will be easier. You'll be a happier worker. Yay. Um, what usually happens to women in those circumstances is that, yeah, I mean, it's easier for them certainly to do their work, but they tend to also take on more domestic labor. Okay, so let me say that again. When women are given more flexible work scenarios, they still get their work done, but guess what they're doing more of now? Housework, kid work, okay. When men are given more flexible work environments, they tend to just get more work done, but they don't also do more domestic work. Does that make sense? So everyone's doing more work. <laughs> But, but it, the, the, um, the whole idea behind flexibility in the work schedule is often to allow people for family time to deal with, you know, a lot of real life scenarios. And what we still tend to see today is that even in flexible workplaces, that flexibility is used by men to do more work, to appear more productive for paid labor. Whereas for women, it is used, yes, to get your job done, but it's used to do more stuff, you know, more, more domestic labor because that's seen as as you know, in this very stereotypical way seen as a woman's responsibility. This is borne out in something you might've heard before, the motherhood penalty versus the fatherhood bonus. This is a huge example of bias. When women um, ask for a raise in a job or if they ask for some sort of promotion or something like this, they are usual, they often, I don't want to say usually, they often suffer from the motherhood penalty. And what this is, is it's a form of bias that presumes that because they are mothers, that they are not as productive worker, a worker, or that they will not be able to fulfill a higher level job. So that's the motherhood penalty. Um, we see this a lot, in fact, when um, a, a boss may say something like, well, I would have offered this job to this woman over here, but you know, she always looks tired. And I, I just wasn't sure if she, you know, would have the stamina to do it or she's always talking about her kids. And so I just didn't know, you know, if she'd really have the time for this. On the other hand, we have some fatherhood bonus. When an employer knows that a man has kids, he tends to get more promotions and more raises. And the rationale for many employers is that they have to support the family. And so um, those are more likely to, to be given to men. Uh, this is, I'm afraid, a very, very well phenomenon. How I would love to tell you that this is just a thing that happened once. <laughs> it is not. Um, it's a very well proven phenomenon uh, that this tends to be the way that American uh, employers understand their workers from a gendered perspective. The more children a woman has, the less she is paid for work, even when she has education and job experience. And the reason why this usually happens is that she often cannot work more because, because someone has to engage in, in childcare.
Okay, we'll see if she hops back on. It looks like she may have been trying to find her charger real fast. So we'll see if she is going to hop back on. So we'll give her just a few minutes here. Um, it does look like if you guys haven't had it seen it, um, Becky is on and she works in the library at Avalon. She put a note in the chat that there are um, some copies of the book that um, Dr. Smith mentioned that you can have access to. So she put that in the chat for you guys to check out if you'd like. I am also going to put in the chat, this is a little premature, but while we wait for um, Dr. Smith to get back on, I am going to um, put a survey here so after the event, if you guys wouldn't mind taking a few moments to check out the survey, I'd love to hear your feedback, both on what you thought about this event, but also how did you hear about this event? So I'll put that in the chat. And um, here's Dr. Smith, she's joining us now. You guys, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. <laughs> did it just go black? Just for you. I have no clue what happened. I'm plugged in and everything. Okay. I shall carry on because I am a woman who is working. <laughs> oh, you know what? You need to make me the um, host again. I apologize. I have no, I have no clue what's going on. I'm going to talk real fast, but excessively. <laughs> Here we are. Okay. This is where we were, right? Whew, okay, again, my apologies. So yeah, so the bad news is, is the more children that a woman has, the less that she is paid. And again, this often has to do with the fact that she is, she's pulled in, in many, many different ways. Um, but what this goes to show us is that even when she's got the education and even when she's got the job experience behind her, um, what tends to be happening is that she is still expected to do most of the domestic labor regarding caretaking. So, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the more kids, you, you know, that, that you have, uh, the more, uh, you know, food you have to worry about, the more house cleaning you have to do, uh, the more, uh, uh, you know, schedule, scheduling that you have to, to, you know, to take care of. And so that's a, a huge factor, particularly for women with larger families. And I think it's something it's something to, to know and understand that this is another thing that's, you know, that's been statistically proven. Now, here's the statistic that just blows my mind every time that, um, that we see it, it kind of come across in a new study. When kids show up, okay, couples that, and we're talking here about heterosexual couples. The dynamic is a little bit different for gay and lesbian couples, but when kids arrive, couples that had previously been pretty equal in their domestic duties, they tend to start doing that male bread, breadwinner, female domestic laborer scenario. And again, a lot of this has to do with the idea that women are naturally more caretaking or nurturing. By the way, there's not evidence for that. We don't see that globally, but that's a really strong stereotype in our culture at least, right? And so it's a dynamic that we have to really pay attention to if we're going to understand why it is that women often make choices that, um, that can economically disadvantage them. Now, this is a global phenomenon as well. And it's a fascinating one. Um, I don't know how many of you have read, it's a wonderful book called Global Woman. Um, the sociologist I mentioned earlier, Arlie Hochschild, um, is, is one of the authors of this, uh, Global Woman. And one of the things that this book is intending to do is to demonstrate how women across the world work. And it's everything from domestic work like nannies, maids, sex workers, um, all of the different forms of work that women across the globe tend towards. And one of the things that we find in our culture, and I'll talk about this graphic in just a minute, but I, I want to look at this quote with you first. Remember that when we're talking about um, um, the first world, that's not a term we use so much anymore, but we're talking about the developed world. So first, you know, second, third world, right? That's where we get the term third world country. Okay. So here is what is happening globally and what has been happening since the 1970s in the US. The first world takes on a role like that of the old fashioned male in the family, pampered, entitled, unable to cook clean or find his socks. Poor countries take on a role like that of the traditional woman within the family patient nurturing and self-denying. A division of labor feminists critiqued when it was local 
has now metaphorically gone global. Now, what are they talking about here? Well, Hochschild refers to this as the care drain. You might have heard the term brain drain before to refer to um, young educated people often from third world countries who will leave their country of origin to come to the US or to Europe or to Canada, right? In order to have higher paid labor. That's been called the brain drain where your, you know, your most intellectually developed people, um, your most educated people leave the country. Now globally, we are seeing what's called a care drain and we are driving it, we and other nations like us. Here's why. When more women in the US work and, you know, and, and work full time, instead of taking on all the labor, instead of doing the second shift and their jobs, those women now have the money to pay someone to do the domestic labor that they no longer have the time to do, right? And so who are those domestic laborers? Who are the majority of daycare providers or house cleaners or you know, other sorts of domestic workers? Well, at, at least in our, in our country, if we're talking about house cleaners, we're, we are to a large degree talking about immigrant women. Um, we see other sorts of phenomena too where immigrant women also in some cases fulfill a lot of childcare roles. So what we see globally, and, and again, it's such a, a, a an impressive statistical phenomenon that we see it happening, uh, particularly in very wealthy countries like Hong Kong, where women from poorer countries like the Philippines are leaving the Philippines to go be a nanny or to go be, you know, a, a, again, you know, some sort of other domestic laborer in a wealthier country because they can make so much more money. A similar thing happens here. Um, again, the point is, is that American men by and large are not doing domestic labor and other women from other countries are now coming to do it for them. So one of the things that, that almost everyone agrees about in terms of how to change this particular problem is that men have to be socialized to do more domestic labor. This problem absolutely does not go away until men start child caretaking and until men start cleaning and cooking and taking care of the birthday party schedule, right? And all of those other things. Um, that go along with this phenomenon. Now, I wanted us to take a quick moment to look at this graphic because we've definitely got this idea in our culture that, and you can see in the upper right-hand corner that um, you know, if you're a wealthy, stay-at-home, often white mom, and you know, and and you do you know the, the work of a stay-at-home mom, then then you know people praise you for doing the right thing. But we have a lot of stereotypes in our culture for women who are not kind of the white wealthy stereotype. Um, if, you know, if someone is an immigrant and they do this work, then it's seen as low paid and it's, you know, anyone can do it. Um, a lot of poor women um, who have made the decision not to work because they can't afford childcare, which is, you know, a very real thing, right, are sometimes blamed for not working. Um, again, we're talking about the, the way that we kind of interject these ethical ideas into family structures. And so we can see examples here of racial bias and ethnic bias. Um, but even gender bias, right, in the way that we tend to praise women, or again, for a lot of non-white women or non-American women or poorer women, the way that we tend to denigrate them. So those are all things that we can see really clearly. Um, let's go ahead and talk about some, some areas for resolution, and then we'll take some questions. Um, one of the biggest things that has to change in order to make some of these problems go away. I've already mentioned that, that men will have to start doing more, but you might have heard the phrase daycare deserts. Uh, these are places where there is very low access to child care or to quality child care, I should say. And much like we now talk about food deserts, daycare deserts are in many cases just as damaging as is a food desert. So there are lots of places around the US, particularly in rural areas, where there is not access to quality um, child care. We've already mentioned that second bullet down that men have to simply start doing more domestic labor. And a lot of that starts with those of us who have sons socializing them to think about themselves as dads, to think about themselves as people who cook and who clean and whose job it is to care for others rather than seeing them as people whose job it is to kind of sever themselves, whether emotionally or physically from the rest of the family. So that's um, a lot of, of parenting books now that wanna target this particular problem, talk a lot about socializing sons to help them think about being involved dads. 
Um, another thing that seems to make a huge difference in our country versus others is that we don't have national maternity and paternity leave policies. So a lot of other countries that have these don't have nearly the same sorts of problems in terms of wage gap um, as we do. And it's because there is time already built in. Your job is secure if you have a baby, right? You don't have to rush back at six weeks. Um, you know, when you're nowhere close to sleeping, right? You, that you have time to actually recover and to know that you have a certain degree of job security. The fourth thing that often uh, at the table when we're having conversations like this um, are issues of, of, you know, policy, corporate policy and pay and social expectations. Is it critical to have a meeting at three o'clock every day? If we could have the meeting at two o'clock and then people could go get their kids from school at three, right? Does the meeting have to happen at three just because it's always happened at three for the past 20 years? Maybe it could be shoved to two, right? So even little bitty things like this that in and of themselves don't seem to be remarkable moves um, could make tremendous um, uh, waves in terms of helping to modify or change some of the gender inequities that we see. And you know, it's important to remember, I've got this picture here, the, that equality is not equity. I'm not sure if you're aware of the two different ways that these terms are used. Equality is, is what we often think about as the box on the left where everyone got given the same thing, but as we can see, it didn't resolve the problem, right? Equity is the image on the right where we understand that people have different lives and different circumstances and providing more specialized approaches to people's lives is often what creates happier everyone for every reason, rather than simply thinking that there's a one size fits all approach. So policymakers about this idea really focus on equity rather than equality, because just throwing again one thing at everyone and thinking it's going to work often does not help to resolve such a complex issue. Okay, are there any questions that you have or any comments? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I feel I can agree totally with uh, a lot of the things that you shared um, in regards to um, a, a straightforward heteros heterosexual relationship, right? Like I, I think about my relationship in my marriage and what our roles are, choices have, have been. Um, but I'm curious if you have an opinion or if you've read any research on how those change when it's um, two men or two women. Yeah. So there's some really fascinating research. In fact, um, my students in my gender theory class were just reading some, um, some a, a new study about housework this week in, in gay and lesbian marriages. Um, housework in gay and lesbian marriages tends to be split more equally. Um, but one of the interesting things is that there is often, um, there is often a desire in certain circumstances, um, depending on a lot of it has to do with kind of feelings of inadequacy or kind of like social, the social shame that a lot of gay and lesbian folks, you know, have, have, um, have experienced about certain types of housework. Um, so if someone, you know, if, if a man has always been, you know, shamed for being quote unquote feminine, then there, then, you know, a lot of, a lot of gay men might report feeling shame about doing some of these feminine roles. Um, so I think it's fair to say that housework still has baggage. Um, it's still got a lot of, of meaning attached to it, but by and large, whenever we look at kind of the statistics, we find that the gay and lesbian relationships tend to have a much more equitable uh, sense of sharing domestic labor in large part um, because um, some of the gender some of the gender norms have already been broken already with gay and lesbian relationships right because homosexuality is already seen as breaking a gender norm so there tends to be less friction between the couple itself regarding who should do what if that makes sense thanks that was great are there any others one Leslie yeah go ahead it may still be too early since we you know we're just now coming well coming out of the pandemic but in your opinion do you think that while it has hindered women from working um or having to leave their 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 career um do you do you think that this will change the work culture for women in a in a positive in a positive way down the line with regards to um, the, the ability to work remotely and juggle. I hope so. Um, but I think, I think, I think we're going to have to stay mad, honestly. <laughs> 
And the reason I say that is because one of the things that we have, yes, that we have found is yes, it, it makes it entirely possible for us to, um, you know, it makes it possible for us to, to work any time of the day. But one of the things that a lot of gender scholars have noted is that the, you know, the Zoom environment also means that women whose boundaries are already encroached upon to a degree that men's aren't, are even more likely to be working more. And so I think there's going to have to be a very clear uh, a sense among, you know, HR folks, among workers, that there are times when someone is off the clock, right? right. And, that, and that there are boundaries and that that is for everyone's good. Um, I have myself a couple of times when a student says they can't meet during my office hours, I've, I've been like, well, you know, I just had dinner. I can meet you right now. And I did that once and I thought, well, mm, that is not okay. That's not how we, you know, how we're going to be able to move forward. Um, because what this does is that it already, it, it really does open women up to, to really well, kind of labor abuses. Yeah. That's what, and I was going to ask that too, um, to follow up with our own mentality on how we, because I, <clears throat> myself, for example, I am still working remotely um, for the fully, but <clears throat> I know that that bandwidth of, of time that you allow, because I don't know if other women experience it, but there's that guilt of, have you done enough during, you know? Uh -huh. so, I know. It's, it's hard. Sometimes the, the boundaries get very blurry. I was doing a seminar last night for um, for some students on how to try to uh, finish the semester strong. <laughs> well, you know, we're like in the last month of the semester and we didn't have a proper spring break like we normally do. And y'all, they are just melting on the screen. You can see them. I mean, they're just sort of like grabbing. <laughs> And, and one of the things, uh, one of our psychology professors, uh, Dr. Jordan Waggy, was on that call. And one of the things that she was um, reminding us, which I thought was super important, and I always love it when she tells me this, because I'm like, yes, I need to remember this, is that, you know, this concept of cognitive load, we only have so much space up here. Mm -hmm. And just because we have a computer in front of us all the time doesn't mean that we get more space up here, right? So there still have to be boundaries and there still is only so much that one can do. And it, there is more pressure now um, because of the stress of the pandemic. I don't know about you all, but I feel like my brain has been moving much more slowly than it, than it did a year ago. Um, it takes me way longer to get anything done. My focus isn't as great as it was. And there's just so much pressure to work all the time. And what she was saying from a psychological perspective is that you you have to force yourself to stop because there's only there's only so much mental room, um, and and that one of the challenges in the future of of really labor in general will, will be how to convince employers and even just our labor culture that we have to stop and take breaks and that we do have to have boundaries even though it is possible for us to work all the time and women are going to be at the center of that because there's so much more pressure. Women are much more likely to be concerned about people pleasing, um, much more likely to be concerned about whether they can look like they've done an excellent job to, you know, the whole, you know, women have to, you know, perform twice as well to, you know, to, to look like they are as good as, you know, how their male competitors often perform. So women will be the ones who will often bear the brunt of that. And I think it's just super important that women are vocal about the need for boundaries, because I do believe that we're going to be one population that could be thrown under the bus in all of this. Mm -hmm. For exactly the reasons you're talking about. It's just too easy to work all the time. Yeah. Is there anyone else? I, I was just gonna say, I can relate to a lot of the content that you covered. I. My husband and I have two kids that are three and almost five. We both work from home. Um, we moved from Kansas City to Denver in the middle of the pandemic and now have declared we're permanently working from home. <laughs> um, he also took a new job at a new company. So now he's permanently working from home from another remote, remote location. So there's a lot of there's a lot of layers that go into this. And I was thinking when Lisa was asking the question around the accessibility and the people pleasing and you know the, the bar and, and making sure that you're performing and you still have the flexibility and the boundaries in your own, it's just reinforcing those. Yeah. Um, so no, no yeah. question, but a, a lot of it definitely resonates. <laughs> yeah, well, I get it. I mean, like I, every time I, I teach on this topic, I'm like, oh, this is so autobiographical. <laughs> 
Um, you know, I spend um, I, I spend my summers writing. You know, normally I, I write books and articles and things in the summer. And I spent many, many, many summers when my kids were little, spending thousands of dollars on nanny care, and yelling through the door, "I'm working, I'm working!" <laughs> right when people were beating and you know putting goldfish mm-hmm. under, you know how how it goes, right? Someone squirting their applesauce tube under the door to get your attention or whatever. <laughs> And it's just, it, it can, it is so difficult for a person who's not been in that primary caretaker role to understand what that's like. And because that primary caretaker role falls so often to women, even whenever, you know, even whenever you hire help, right? Um, it's, it, it's a really important conversation, I think, that for a lot of people to have, even in your own relationships. Um, you know, what does it mean if, for instance, we, we have this conversation in our house. Um, here's a little personal sharing moment. Why is it that at five o'clock every day, everyone asks me what we're eating for dinner? I don't know. I'm trying to but, but, ask my husband. <laughs> okay, well, so, but, but see, like, right, but, but this, is, this is something that's changing. So we've got, to, we've got to help facilitate those changes. And the more people that say, well, you know, my husband cooks, yes, right? These are, these are the shifts that we need to see happening if we really hope to have, I mean, happier marriages, more gender equitable relationships, um, you know, more psychologically whole people. One of the things about um, that we know from a lot of that, you know, the, again, that kind of mid 20th century ideal is that there were a lot of unhappy people. A lot of the earliest feminist writings, uh, from, well, not the earliest, but the earliest were like in the, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. But the, the feminist writings from the middle 20th century are a bunch of women who are like, is this all that there is, right? I, I, this is, I need more. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's kind of, it's interesting to read those things and to still see that there's a lot of resonance today, even though society has changed a lot. Yeah. And the pressure of not repeating, but finding your own path. And oh, you yeah. know, I enjoy work. I also enjoy being at home with my kids and it's like this tug of war, which decision is the right decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and thankfully my husband is very supportive. Um, and we mm-hmm. actually joked who's going to be the first one to leave the workforce to be home with our kids. Cause we both enjoy both aspects of it. Um, but it's finding the right balance for sure. And you know, the different it ways is. of life cycle. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And it, and I've just, you know, even as my kids have gotten older and more independent, thankfully, like they can cook for themselves now, like it's awesome. (laughs) But, uh, but the, even like just the, the nature of those relationships change too. So it does feel like at every new, I don't know, at every new kid stage, there's a new, you know, there's a new uh, sort of struggle that emerges Mm -hmm. to to figure all these things out. So adult reflection or personal reflection. Yeah. 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 It's all the adulting over and over. (laughs) Is there anything else, any other questions that you had? Well, I definitely just want to thank you, Leslie, for agreeing to doing this, for sharing this with us, for taking the time to put it together. I thought it was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, it sounds like others did as well. So thank you for doing this for us. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm sorry I went dark there. I have absolutely no clue what happened. No worries. I'll blame it on the poltergeist in my mother's house. We'll call it that, right? Um, it'll, 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 it'll be like a, a good pandemic story. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I'm so, I'm so glad to have a question. If we oh, have sure, sure. Um, so, you know, we have in, in companies and organizations, corporate, nonprofit all across the sector, you know, they're implementing, they're, they're, they're playing heavy on, on diversity, diversity and inclusion. And they're talking about, you know, um, racial discrimination, but why, why is there not more discussion around gender issues in the workforce so that organizations with a more patriarchal, patriarchal culture can learn not to be that way? <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. I get it. It's fine. What, why, are the, why, is there, why is that not part of their, their leadership training? So uh, embrace yourself. My kids are here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes. Okay. Yes, mom. Okay. My mother's going to head them off the driveway, but maybe they'll be quiet. Maybe not. So the very short answer, and Lisa, I'm totally happy to email about this with okay. you too, but the, the short answer is that when you look at the structure of patriarchies, um, women are rewarded for going along with them. Yeah. And okay. so, um, they are very, very slow to change because women, um, are more likely to modify their lives to go along with them than to, uh, push against them. So that's like the big sociological answer. Um, but the, um, 
the more imminent answer is that we have to be talking about all of those kinds of diversity together because the things that will help women are also the thing, you know, it, it, companies want racial diversity. Great. Um, but some of those uh, racially diverse employees are women, <laughs> right? So it, it is, I, I wouldn't think of it as, um, as a bunch of separate siloed items. These are all things that we have to be doing in order to improve diversity workplace in every single way. Um, and I think that that one of the reasons why certain populations have had um, better luck in the corporate workplace is not because they have worked harder or tried harder. It is it is whether or not the corporate workplace has made room for them. Mm -hmm. And and you're right that it still remains an overwhelmingly white and patriarchal place. And um, and making accommodations. Uh, I don't even know that I want to call them accommodations making room for real people's lives, let's put it that way, um, is, and, and here we, we could start down like a business ethics road that would take right. me forever. Yeah. Um, forever. <laughs> but, um, you know, we don't, a, a lot of us love our jobs. I adore my job, but my job is not all that I am. And yeah. um, particularly in the ways that we, in our country, understand work, we understand our identity and our work is one and the same. And so we can't really start to we can't really start to talk about meaningful ethical change until we start talking about the ways that we even understand work in our culture. So yeah. there's a lot going on there. But yeah, you're right. You're right. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Okay, the kids are here, everyone. <laughs> Maybe this is my cue. Um, it's been a pleasure, really. Um, if you would like to, to ask any other questions or chat, um, leslie.smith at avila.edu. I'm, I'm happy to talk. I do it all the time. Uh, when I do you know, community uh, conversations, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you've got. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Well, that was good timing.